Good afternoon and welcome to IBA News this Thursday, the 28th of July. I'm Elon Aslan Levy, joining you live from Jerusalem. On the second anniversary of Israel's Operation Protective Edge in the Gaza Strip, top government officials are still arguing whether Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu kept ministers in the dark about the potential threat of Hamas terror tunnels. I'm joined now in the studio by our political reporter, Kalev Ben David. Kalev. Thanks, Elon. Yeshati party leader Yair Lapid, who served as finance minister during Operation Protective Edge, accused Prime Minister Netanyahu of misleading the public over the issue of whether he and other cabinet ministers were kept fully briefed about the terror tunnels dug by Hamas under the Gaza borders. Lapid said on Channel 2 last night that there was no thorough discussion over the tunnels in the cabinet prior to the 2014 Gaza operation. Dozens of Israeli soldiers died fighting to destroy the tunnels, which some say caught the Israeli military unprepared. Lapid's remarks echo similar criticism of Netanyahu by fellow cabinet ministers Naftali Bennett and Avigdor Lieberman, as well as an interim report by the State Controller's Office asserting that the Prime Minister should have done a better job of briefing the cabinet on security matters. Netanyahu rejected the criticism, saying in a statement that Lapid and other ministers were given written reports about the tunnels well before the Gaza operation, and that Lapid should know that it is the responsibility of cabinet ministers to be familiar with the material presented to them. In the meantime, as this debate rages on, Israeli military sources told reporters that Hamas is now digging six miles of new tunnels in Gaza each month. And Israel has no sure way of detecting them. Hello. Kalev, thank you very much. A short time from now, Knesset Speaker Yuli Edelstein is due to visit the settlement outpost of Amona, the Israeli community north of Ofra in Samaria, which stands to be uprooted and its residents transferred to other communities in the nearby Shiloh block. Edelstein vowed to do everything in his power to protect the residents from being evacuated. Attorney General Avichai Mandelblit is set to rule by the end of August whether the defense minister can use the absentee's property law to save the outpost from being cleared. This would allow the ministry to legalize construction on a plot of land close to the existing outpost located on the outskirts of Afar. In 2014, the High Court of Justice ruled that the outpost must be removed by the end of this year because it was built without permits on private Palestinian land. The court ruling was in response to a petition submitted by Palestinian landowners who live in the nearby West Bank village of Silwad and claim ownership over the land. European Union Ambassador Lars Farborg Andersen has criticized Israel for destroying Palestinian structures located in the West Bank's Area C, which is under Israel's full control. Appearing before the Knesset yesterday, he charged that from 2009 to 2013, Israeli authorities approved 44 building permits for Palestinians out of a total of 2,000 requests submitted. He also claimed that Israel has demolished 91 illegal Palestinian houses so far this year, far more than last year. Responding to the charges, the coordinator of government activities in the territories said action is only taken against structures erected without the necessary building approval. Aviva Ba'ilan, head of the foreign ministry department in charge of European organizations, said the EU is considering suing Israel for damages for structures built with EU funding that were destroyed. Illegal construction merits destruction, she said. Israel doesn't accept the EU's interpretation of humanitarian aid. Israeli authorities are demolishing and confiscating EU and member states funded projects in Area C at an increasing rate, claiming that these structures are built without a permit. But the reality is that it's virtually impossible for Palestinians to get a building permit in Area C. In the first six months of 2016 alone, 91 EU and member states funded structures in Area C have been demolished or confiscated. This is more than in all of 2015, where the figure stood at some 75 structures. Meanwhile, in a related issue, the U.S. State Department admonished Israel over its plans to construct 323 housing units in Jerusalem neighborhoods located over the Green Line. 
A statement released by the department's spokesman, John Kirby, said such steps are corrosive to the cause of peace and are the latest examples of what appears to be a steady acceleration of settlement activity, which is systematically undermining the prospects for a two-state solution. His comments came a day after the Israel Lands Authority published tenders for the construction of new housing units in the Jerusalem neighborhoods of Gilo, Hal Choma, Neve Yaakov, and Pisgat Ze'ev. From the West Bank to the World Bank, I'm very happy to welcome to the studio Dr. Hafez Ghanem, Vice President of the World Bank for the Middle East and North Africa. Dr. Ghanem, welcome. Thank you, Elon. The Middle East is now going through a period of profound turbulence. What steps is the World Bank taking to try to stabilize our region? Well, you know, the World Bank, we are a development institution. Our role is to fight poverty and to work for uh, a shared prosperity. When we look at the Middle East today, what we're trying to do is see how we can contribute to stability in the region, to peace in the region. Uh, so uh, we're focusing on four, on four areas of work. The first area is uh, to try to what we call renew the social contract, improve the relationship between governments and the population. Second area, increase uh, cooperation within the region, uh, regional cooperation uh, uh, on issues like water, for, for example. The third area is to deal with the refugee crisis. Uh, which is crisis uh, plural. Crisis plural, uh, and the fourth uh, and the fourth area where uh, we're, uh, we're working is to prepare for uh, recovery and reconstruction, uh, especially in economies that have been affected by turmoil. How much is all this going to cost? Well, uh, the uh, the cost uh, in, in money terms can can be huge, but it's not all, all money that will be uh, given by donors or by governments. A lot of, uh, a lot of the reconstruction will be will be done by the private sector. However, there is a very impor important point that I want to make: Reconstru rebuilding bridges, uh, structures is is relatively easy. The, the real challenge is to rebuild institutions, to rebuild social, the social fabric and rebuild trust uh, between communities and, and among, uh, communi between the citizens and their governments. You mentioned that your strategic plan includes regional cooperation. Yes. I'm wondering whether you're sensing any interest among Arab governments in reversing their historic boycott of Israel and embracing the opportunities of collaborating with our country. Well, uh, one, one, one of the regional projects that we are supporting is what we call uh, the Red Debt Project, which is a, a, a project uh, between uh, Jordan, Israel, and, Pal and the Palestinian Authority, which uh, uh, includes this, a desalination plant in, in Jordan uh, with water going to the Dead Sea. This project is really going ahead? Uh, this, uh, this project, I hope, is really going ahead. We have been working with, the, uh, with our Jordanian counterparts, with the Israeli counterparts, with the Palestinians uh, to put this project together. And this is an example. But, but in terms of Arab capitals who don't have diplomatic relations with Israel, is there, is there a sense perhaps in breaching that taboo and, and taking full advantage of the opportunities presented well, by cooperation? I, I would really wouldn't know, know much about that. I mean, our focus is really, uh, we, we, as a development institution, we, we invest uh, in fighting poverty in the countries that, that, that need it, in the poorer countries in the region. And so we, for example, the Red Debt Project that, uh, that I've just described to you, we, we, are, uh, we are supporting it at the request of the government of Jordan. Okay, well, beyond the Red Debt Project, how is this regional strategy expected to find expression in the case of Israel and the Palestinians? How, how is the World Bank helping to, to stabilize this, this uh, arena well, as well? Well, well uh, first of all, I believe that it is important for stability and, and peace in the region uh, to uh, bring about uh, economic development in, in the Palestinian territories, uh, to fight unemployment in the Palestinian territories. Today, the unemployment rate in, in, the, in the West Bank is more than 20 percent. In Gaza, it's more than 40 percent. Uh, so uh, creating jobs, uh, creating hope uh, is one of the main areas where we're trying to operate, and, and, uh, and developing uh, uh, the economy. The second area is trying to build the institutions, Palestinian institutions, uh, that provide services for and is the this the same, same business as usual, or has there been a, a shift in the context of this new strategy? Uh, well, it, 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 uh, I would say that in the case of the Palestinian territories, our strategy has always been, because remember, we started working uh, in West Bank and Gaza with the Oslo process. So our, our strategy has always been to support the peace process.
uh, and therefore uh, I don't think I don't see a, a big shift. Uh, that the, the difference in our in our strategy is really affecting, uh, of, say, our work in Lebanon or, or in Jordan, where we are focusing increasingly in helping those countries deal with a huge influx of Syrian refugees. Okay, well, I'm glad you mentioned the the Oslo peace process and and the Palestinian economy because specifically, I wanted to ask you last September at the AHLC summit in, in New York, you argued that there are many steps that Israel, the Palestinian Authority, and the international community can take to improve the Palestinian economy, even before for final status negotiations. What did you mean? Well, uh, th there are d d uh, uh, several important steps, and, and I will give you two, ex two, two examples. Uh, one example is in terms of supporting Palestinian institutions, supporting the Palestinian Authority. Uh, it is important for the donor community. Uh, to continue uh, uh, providing financial support uh, f uh, f uh, for, uh, to the Palestinians. We have seen a decline in the financial support to the Palestinian authorities over the, over the last two years, uh, and, and this obviously uh, creates problems for them. In terms of economic development and creating more uh, possibilities, uh, Israel ca ca can help by providing more uh, uh, work permits for Palestinians, for example, by uh, encouraging more uh, Israeli businesses uh, to do subcontracting with, pal uh, with, with Palestinian companies. So that, there are steps that can be taken, obviously, obviously, in, in the final analysis, to have uh, long-term growth and development in the Palestinian territories, you need peace and stability. Dr. Arnhem, thank you very much for your time. Have a safe flight home. Thank you, Aaron. There are roughly 500 foreign volunteers currently serving in the Israel Defense Forces, with some 80% of them in combat infantry units. According to Defense Ministry figures just released, 45% of these soldiers are from France, 29% from the United States, and about 5% from the United Kingdom, with the rest coming from another 18 countries across the diaspora. The volunteers, who must be Jewish, serve at least a year and a half in the Machal program. This is the second year running that the largest number of foreign volunteers is from France, but the Calita organization of French Olim warns that many of the French volunteers tend to drop out since they are inadequately prepared for army service. Speaking of army service, IDF special forces have concluded a joint military exercise in the Negev with U.S. Marines, which was reportedly aimed at coordinating combat techniques for fighting Islamic State fighters. The drill, dubbed Noble Shirley, was revealed today by Channel 2 and confirmed by military sources. Israeli Air Force, Navy and ground forces were involved in the drill alongside American hovercraft. The exercise stimulated helicopter landings behind enemy lines, storming and securing a beachhead, urban warfare and other forms of combat that U.S. forces can apply in the fight against ISIS. The Noble Shirley exercise has taken place every summer for the past few years. The number of Palestinian prisoners incarcerated in Israel who joined a hunger strike rose to 53 today, compared with 19 yesterday, according to the Israel Prison Service. Palestinian media reports claim that 100 prisoners have joined the hunger strike in solidarity with three prisoners who have been on hunger strike for between 22 to 44 days to protest their being held in administrative detention. A spokesman for the prison services told IBA that the security prisoners striking are located in six different prisons and that steps are being taken to have them end their strike, including barring visits by family members and solitary confinement. Turning to the United States, presidential election and the Democrats have stepped up their attacks on Republican candidate Donald Trump at their national convention in Philadelphia, bringing out some political heavyweights to urge support for Hillary Clinton. IBA's political correspondent Kalev Ben-David reports. U.S. President Barack Obama got the biggest applause in the third day of the Democratic convention as he urged voters to make Hillary Clinton his successor in the White House by highlighting her experience and qualifications for the job. And even in the midst of crisis, she listens to people and she keeps her cool and she treats everybody with respect. And no matter how daunting the odds, no matter how much people try to knock her down, she never, ever quits. That is the Hillary I know. That's the Hillary I've come to admire. And that's why I can say with confidence, there has never been a man or a woman, 
not me, not Bill, nobody more qualified than Hillary Clinton to serve as president of the United States of America. Former New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg also took to the convention podium, despite being a political independent and one-time Republican, and added his endorsement of Clinton while delivering a blistering attack on fellow billionaire Trump. Through his career, Donald Trump has left behind a well-documented record of bankruptcies and thousands of lawsuits and angry stockholders and contractors who feel cheated and disillusioned customers who feel they've been ripped off. Trump says he wants to run the nation like he's running his business? God help us. I'm a New Yorker, and I know a con when I see one. Democratic vice presidential candidate Tim Kaine also showed that despite his reputation as a political nice guy, he is ready to get nasty about Trump. To me, to me, it just seems like our nation, it is just too great to put it in the hands of a slick-talking, empty promising self-promoting one man wrecking crew the democratic convention climaxes tonight with hillary clinton needing to give the speech of her life in order to leave philadelphia with enough of a bump in the polls to regain her previous lead over donald trump in the race for the u.s presidency this is Khaled ben david for iba news and joining us now in the studio to wrap up some of the topics that made headlines this week is senior columnist for the Jerusalem Post, Amots Asael. Amots, hello. Hi, hello. Uh, earlier this week, the Knesset's Ministerial Committee for Legislation approved the repeal of a law secured by Yesh Atid to require Haredi elementary schools to teach the core curriculum. Where does this leave efforts to integrate the Haredi community into broader society and the workforce? First of all, hap what happened in terms of legislation was not a change of existing reality, but the prevention of change in the future. Because it hasn't been implemented the yet. The law specified that in 2018, in order for an ultra-Orthodox school to obtain uh, state funding, it would have to teach a core curriculum, and this will not be the case now thanks to this legislation. Having said this, this ultra-Orthodox battle to prevent the introduction into ultra-Orthodox ultra schools of uh, uh, a secular core curriculum is a rear-end battle. Um, yes, they have won administratively and they have won legislatively, but this is theoretical. Down in the field, thousands of young adult ultra-Orthodox men and women are flocking into um, vocational colleges, they're obtaining professions and they're joining the Israeli secular workplace and once there, they get a feel of the gap between them and the graduates of the Israeli secular and modern Orthodox education systems and this is not what they will want for their own children. In other words, what you'll face in upcoming years is that ultra-Orthodox parents will want on their own volition to have their children obtain some kind of secular education that they themselves did not get, only it will not happen by coercion the way Yeshati tried to do it. Certainly encouraging. Uh, over to regional affairs, a Lebanese news, newspaper reported that Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has met with Russian President Putin in secret last month and discussed the so-called Clinton plan, a bill that is, uh, for peace between Syria and Israel. Is this report credible? Well, what is happening right now down in the field as we're talking is that the military balance is really shifting in Bashar Assad's favor. Uh, the big flashpoint of Aleppo up in the north is, is gradually falling into his hands with a very massive Russian help. All this is now approaching a turning point because the Syrians wisely understand that the Turks are busy with themselves and that the Americans are busy with themselves and the Europeans are busy with themselves. This is an opportune time for them and it seems as if, militarily speaking, the die has been cast and, and this uh, Syrian government, Bashar Assad's government, has the upper hand with Russian tutelage and more than that, it's more than sponsorship. It's probably a Russian dictate. This is why the wording of the announcement that came today in this regard, the one that shows uh, that creates humanitarian corridors for people to flee through from Aleppo was issued not from uh, Damascus, but from Moscow. What this means is that there is new commotion in the region and that Moscow is masterminding it. And since these are the circumstances, there is an expectation that there will be some kind of a Russian, Russian brokerage 
uh, of some kind of a new understanding between the emerging strongman or, or re-emerging strongman of Syria and Israel's government. However, at this point, it's all speculation. So in short, Syria might really be planning for the day after it's reconstituted as a, as a state again? It will, uh, as it survives, as it say, never actually formally dismantled, but it did practically uh, decompose, and, and that decomposition uh, still remains to be recomposed. Everyone understands that. But Bashar Assad apparently has survived the worst is behind him. Amot, briefly, since the failed coup in Turkey, President Erdogan has been engaged in a very intensive purge. Where is this leading Turkey domestically and in its regional policies? I think what we're uh, uh, seeing here is a counter coup. Um, this is already the scales and the diversity of, of, of the counterattack that he has unleashed uh, is already beginning to remind historians of, of Stalin's purges uh, in the 30s. Uh, in other words, it's systematic, it's pre-planned, and it goes across the admin, administrative um, uh, section. In other words, we're talking here about a, a systematic assault on police, academia, the media, uh, and of course, the army, and uh, that means that he has a master plan of imposing himself and his Islamism on Turkey, and the secular Turkey that the world has known uh, since the morning after World War I is apparently history. Certainly a story we'll be following very closely. Thank you, Amot. Thank you, Alon. In arts and entertainment, a masterclass for promising Israeli opera singers is taking place in Jerusalem. Sponsored by a Holocaust survivor, it brings international opera professionals to the capital with curtains up on performances next week. IBA's Ari O'Sullivan visited the workshop and brings us this story. <laughs> of promising young Israeli opera singers is getting instruction from visiting opera director Claudia Isabel Martin. Oh, no, I don't want it. It's like flies. Yeah? It's part of a project called International Masterclass and Zamboki Competition of Vocal Arts. We are here to give. Uh, there are our master classes in Israel that are profit uh, orientated, and we are here we're quality orientated. And we also aim to connect between our excel excellent young artists. We have only chosen the excellent, the best excellent artists um, from abroad and from Israel, and they in they get the best tuition, only the best can come to Imvesh, and we connect between these excelling teachers and, and uh, singers and the people who need music the most. I do feel like this masterclass gives us so much opportunities to exp working with wonderful, wonderful musicians, very important people in the industry that come from abroad. Um, uh, giving us a lot of tools. Opera is an international thing. That's why another reason I, I wanted to come because since you live in Israel and I have two kids to raise, I, I don't uh, always meet a lot of international opera um, professionals. So this is a very good chance to meet them. The entire workshop is being funded by Holocaust survivor Yosef Zamboki. The music saved him as well because he used to play harmonica as a 10 year old and the Germans gave him food. So. He claims that music saved his life, and uh, now he's giving back to music and to uh, Holocaust survivors. Claudia Isabel Martin says she loves teaching Israelis, and the irony of being German in a project funded by a Holocaust survivor was not lost on her. I feel very uh, excited about it, actually, because that's also, you know, when you're having um, opera, yeah, that's a very different way how to communicate with people, yeah, it's music, it's art. For me personally, if I'm the younger generation, yeah, I know about the history, yeah, but I'm just curious and excited to meet the people and to work with them, actually. The IMVJ is performing Mozart's Magic Flute on Thursday, August 4th, and Pyramus and Thisbe on Saturday, August 6th at the Israel Center for Excellence in Jerusalem. Holocaust survivors and soldiers get in for free. Arya O'Sullivan for IBA News. In finance, shares are down on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange and the shekel is mixed in foreign trading.
In weather, tomorrow we'll see a slight rise in temperatures, remaining stable through the weekend. If you're planning on hitting the beach on the Mediterranean this weekend, expect waves between 70 centimeters and 1 meter tall. That's all for this week, so from me and the entire IBA team, it's a good evening and Shabbat Shalom, live from Jerusalem.